That Verse 9 point. of chapter 2 says, They had heard the king, they went their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So why do we celebrate? It has nothing to do with Saturnalia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Salty Pastor Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you learn and grow in your faith. It is a journey that you are on, whether you like it or not, but it is one that you can either grow and get strong in, or you can get weak and whiny. And we are here to make you strong by helping you critically think for yourself so you know what you believe and why you believe it. My name is Jesse Mara. I'll be your host, but we cannot do the Salty Pastor Podcast without the Salty Pastor himself, Dr. Douglas Peak. Welcome to the Salty Pastor Gym. <laughs> All right. No flabby Christians here. No flabby Christians. We are here to Bump you up. Yes. That is a really, really old reference. No, it's, all right. it's, <laughs> it's old. Works. So I'm so glad that you guys are here, especially this Christmas season. It's just really great to celebrate Christmas and the hope that we have in Christ and really realize that even when things aren't going well and the world seems to go off the rails, we can depend on something that happened thousands of years ago to just give us strength and inspire us. It's a truth that never changes. And it always brings us hope and joy in the midst of any situation. Love Christmas. We do too. And we are in our series coming home for Christmas. It is so great to talk about God's invitation for us to all come home. And mm -hmm. we want to invite you guys to join us in celebrating Christmas here at Foothills because we have seven Christmas Eve services this year on December 24th. That is when Christmas Eve is. It has not changed. Um, and we're doing three here on campus. So mm -hmm. if you would like to attend in person, we have three on campus. Those on campus times are 2, 3.30, and 5. If you'd like to watch online, you can also watch those services online, but we'll have yes. four additional online services mm -hmm. after those times. After that, yeah. So please join us for those, whether it's online or on campus. We would love to have you. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday, we dug into... The record of the birth of Jesus recorded by Matthew in mm -hmm. chapter 2. Yes. And it's where we hear about the Magi, the men yes. from the East, the right? The men from the East. Um, also known as the wise men <laughs> by the some, wise right? men, yes. So let's talk about these practical implications of this event and how it relates to this invitation for us to come home to God. Well, a couple of things that we hear today when we're talking about the birth of Jesus Christ need to be cleared up. Okay. First, in our society today, it's really popular. And the reason I want to bring this up is because it's super popular on YouTube and in TikTok and these Where other everybody things, gets their information. When everybody gets days. their information. And so this is what your kids and your grandkids are hearing. They hear it over and over and over again. And so a great thing to ask your kids or your grandkids at Christmas is, hey, have you guys ever heard this and what do you think? First one is this. The idea that Jesus was never considered special because this event never actually happened. There was no star. There was no magi. It's all made up. There's no way a star can be in the sky and point people in certain ways. The second one is this, is that the, the, the celebration of Christmas and Jesus' birthday is it didn't happen on December 25th. He was born in the summertime and all Christians did is adapt the pagan festival known as Saturnalia. It was worship of the sun and the sun God. And they just stole it because they were trying to Christianize a pagan thing. So it was kind of like a top down order type of thing. All of this is absolute malarkey. It's all completely made up. It has zero basis in fact or history or science or anything else. But there's a lot of people propagating this idea all and, and the time. trying to argue it. So yeah, what so are what are the arguments against it? How can well, let's we tackle these once at a time with the facts and let's talk about the star. OK, uh, people are saying today, oh, the star, this is impossible. Star doesn't move around star in the can't sky. Around. You can't follow the sky star. You can't do this. Well, let's look at the facts. And in Matthew chapter two, there are nine separate facts about the star. OK, number one, the star signified birth. No, that's what they said. They, we saw his star that the king of the Jews would be born. So they believe, the Magi, that the stars signify birth. Number two, it signified kingship. Where is the king of the Jews? Okay. It signified, uh, it had to do with the Jews, right? He is the king of the Jews. It rose in the east. It says, we saw his star in the east rise, and then we 
followed it. King Herod was not aware of it. We know that. It appeared at a specific time. It endured or showed up over a period of time. It was in front of the Magi when they traveled south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Okay, that's significant, yes. right? And then finally, it stopped over Bethlehem. So everybody looks at that and goes, oh, see how that's such a bunch of malarkey? Those nine things are impossible. There's no way that that could ever occur. Correct. I've, that, that, I've heard this argument. Yeah. yeah most I, people. I don't know how to refute it, so I'm hoping you got Well, astronomer Craig it. Chester used the work of archaeologist and historian Ernest L. Martin. And uh, basically what happened is Larson, um, uh, there's a guy by, uh, uh, I can't think of his first name, uh, Larson, who is a historian, and he uses astronomer Craig Chester and archaeological uh, historian Ernest Martin's works. And he says, look, all nine of these characteristics of the star of Bethlehem are found in events that actually took place in the skies in 3 to 2 BC. What actually occurred? Now, this is what we know. Uh, not uh, This is th through, through astronomy. So this is the science of the stars and the heavens. The, not astrology, which is, you a know. very different thing. Yeah, get your palm read stuff. It's astronomy. It is a science. And he says, number one, there was a triple conjunction of Jupiter, uh, Regulus, and the the final one was uh venus okay and they there was what was called uh, a triple conjunction it started in 3 bc okay okay now if you remember last week we said that the monk counted wrong and we think that jesus was born somewhere around two to four bc right okay. so it's the monk got close but he was off just a titch and so in 3 bc it became a very bright star. Jupiter is also called, particularly in that language and known in their constellations, as the star of kings. So it's the king star, Jupiter right. is. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. Mm -hmm. Its mass is greater than the sun. A lot of people are not aware of how, so it's, it tends to shine pretty bright. It, it, what happened is it converged in its orbit with a star that doesn't move known as Regulus. And Regulus is the brightest star in the constellation of Leo, also known as the Lion constellation. Since it's the brightest, it is often called the Lion's Heart Star. Okay. okay. And what is Jesus known as? He is the what of Judah? The, the lion. lion of Judah. You see? And according to our star charts, this event occurred September... 3 BC. So you're saying there's basically three stars that overlap their orbits. Yes, they at converged. At the same time to yeah. basically create a super bright star. Yes. That was would have been very noticeable to people who spent all of their time yeah. looking at the stars. Yeah. So and this if, is proven by yeah, this here's an illustration. astronomer. Yeah. So you're looking at this, and it, this would be like... Okay, you're trying to go someplace in downtown Boise, let's say, for instance, you've never been there, right? So you put the address in your GPS, and yes. your GPS is navigating you down there, and you're looking at it, and the little blue dot, which is what? You. And then the little red flag, or the little upside-down teardrop, or whatever you call that thing, yes. is where your destination is, right? And you, you're getting close to it, and you're, when those two things converge, what do you think? I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I have arrived. And if you're following, the, you know, the person talking to you either through Google or Zero, they always say you've arrived at your destination. Right. And you're looking around and you're going, I, I don't know where this is. I, I had a similar phenomena here when I first moved to Italy uh, in my sabbatical in 2016. Is that I was looking for a grocery store uh -huh. and I was following Google Maps and this I was in Aosta, Italy, which is kind of northern Italy in the ski country mountains. And I got to this place where it said there's a grocery store. It said you've arrived at your destination. And I was like. There's no grocery store. I'm standing on the street <laughs> in front of this storefront, right? And I'm sitting around looking, and then somebody comes out of an elevator with a bag of groceries, and I say, okay, what's going on here? The, the grocery store was in the basement. Oh, that's interesting. That was really interesting. And not easy to find. Not easy to find. <laughs> so, but... In the same way, so what happens is these guys see what all these stars are doing. They track them every single day. It's their GPS. It's how they navigate. And it says, okay, something's big happening. What happens when Jupiter, the king star, is getting close to Venus? And what was Venus considered? Venus was the goddess of what? Love. Love and fertility. Okay. 
So the king star, Jupiter, comes up and converges with Venus. What does that say? The is king is born. A king will be born, okay. <laughs> right? Next yes. to Regulus, which is the lion in the constellation. So it's Jewish in nature, yes. right? The lion of Judah. Judah. Okay. So um, what happens is that happens in September 3 BC. Okay. Then in June of 2 BC, so nine months later, that's a significant amount of time. Nine months later, Jupiter continues to orbit and in its orbit around the sun, it appears close to the conjunction. This is when it comes into the Venus. So it starts at Regulus and then nine months later, what happens? Overlaps with Venus. It overlaps with Venus, which we just discussed is what? Birth of a king. The birth of a king. So we see in 3 BC, the the virgin becomes pregnant. Nine months later, Jupiter tracks around to Venus. Oh, a child has been born. born. Okay. Then in Hebrew, remember Matthew is Jewish and he is a Levite writing his gospel to convince what? All of his fellow Jews that Jesus is a prophesied Messiah. Jupiter is not just known as the king star, but in Hebrew it is called Sedek. And you know what Sedek means? Righteousness. Mm. So it is a righteousness of the king, a term that was used for what? The Messiah. Yes. Okay. Now, because the planet Venus represents love and fertility, we talked about how that uh, would say, oh, we're, we associate this with birth. Okay. And then they come to Herod and how does Herod receive what they say? He takes them seriously, right? If, if you are in downtown Boise and you're looking for a destination in the basement of something, you can't find it. And you walk up to a stranger and you show them your phone, right? Yeah. Where it shows the little red teardrop, upside down teardrop and the blue dot. And it says, hey, I'm looking for this wine bar. I'm looking for this store. And, and you say, look, it says I'm there. What is that person going to do? They're going to say... Oh yeah, you yeah, are. And it's, that's, that's because right. it's hard to find because it's like behind this thing in the back and the alley, or you enter through the alley or it's in the basement or it's right. on the third floor or whatever. Right. So in other words, they're going to see your GPS and your destination and they're going to take what you seriously. Well, it's the same thing. Like, you know, you see this in every space apocalypse movie, but yeah. NASA comes to the president and says, Hey, this asteroid's going to slam into the planet. We should probably look at it. And he doesn't go, meh. Yeah. Nah, it's fine. Yeah, he doesn't say that. He place trusts doesn't, the guys yeah. that have been looking he at the stars, stars and have the math and know the things, and yeah. they go, hey. Yeah, we got to take this guy we seriously. Take this seriously, so the king <laughs> yeah, or the took, president takes him seriously. Yeah. This would be the same. This yeah. was basically NASA for the old times, right? <laughs> yeah. They're Imagine the I was NASA showing up. Yeah, there's a big ass, uh, a big happening. rock coming towards us. But so astronomer David Renneke independently found that uh, June 2 BC planetary conjunction, he, he found it in through the star charts. Because it's interesting because we've been tracking stars now for uh, you know 100 years. years. And, and prior to that, it was, yeah, thousands of years. But in computer models, oh, yes. we've been tracking it. And so there's one interesting thing about the computer models because the paths and orbits are so consistent you can fast forward or a thousand rewind. light years or rewind okay. thousands of years and know exactly what you are looking at and he said look this convergent in 2 bc would be a very bright to them convergent have you ever noticed that around here you look up the stars you don't see much but you go camping where there's no mm. light pollution at all and what do you see and just everything massive, yeah. massive amount up, of stars. It's one of my favorite things about going up to the church camp is, yeah. you know, you're walking outside at night and you finish bonfire and it's just literally this yeah. multitude of stars. Yeah. And you can see the Milky Way, you know, just these clusters that look like a yeah. flow and you see all this. Well, obviously they knew this as well. And this is why most scholars believe Jesus was born sometime in June and that's what most scholars think because of these astronomical events, right? And I don't mean astronomical as a big, but I mean as, as scientific astronomy, that he was probably born sometime in the summertime in June. But here's what's really interesting is uh, why then do we celebrate Christmas in December? 
That Verse 9 quote. of chapter 2 says, They had heard the king, they went their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So why do we celebrate? It has nothing to do with Saturnalia. Jupiter next continued to move, then it stopped in its apparent retrograde motion on December 25th of 2 BC. And if you were in Jerusalem, it would appear over the town of Bethlehem. So we're actually celebrating when the Magi found Jesus is what we're really celebrating. Not necessarily his physical birth, but when the first people really came to worship and or or pronounce, hey, this this is the thing, right? Yeah, I, I I think that there's a couple things about that. Number one is in Jewish culture, you're born, but you're not considered a person until you're presented at the temple, right, on the eighth day and given a name. So okay. you don't even have a name, For you know, first at first. Yeah, and it's like uh, the baby. Where's the baby? So look, so, look, and and here's the bottom line: planets in their orbits have a stationary point. A planet moves eastward through the stars, but as it approaches the opposite point in the sky from the sun, it appears to slow, come to a full stop, and move backwards, so westward, through the sky for some weeks. Again, it slows, stops, and then resumes its eastward course once again. This is according to the uh, astronomer Chester. The date of December 25th that Jupiter appeared to stop while in retrograde motion took place in the season of Hanukkah and is the date later chosen to celebrate Christmas. The Magi found Jesus sometime in December, sometime around the 25th, and it was then that they presented their gifts to Jesus. And what is the primary thing that we do at Christmas is we give what? Gifts. Gifts. So that's why we celebrate Christmas on that day, because the actual day when Jesus was born, nobody knows. But only in Western cultures do we place a, such a significance on your birthday. Whereas in other cultures, the significance is on maybe your naming day or your, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or in Roman, in the Roman Empire, it was when you were named by the fa uh, pater familias as a part of the family. You may not be named as a part of the of the family by your, the pater familias until, you know, your 10th birthday. Mm. <laughs> so you're technically not even a person then, right. right? With any rights at all. So, and my point in sharing this is that in their eyes, this was a fluid period of time when they were picking how, and remember is the Romans, Christians, people who are part of the Roman empire who said, this is when we want to have a mass that celebrates the birth of Christ. And we're going to coincide with when the Magi presented the gifts to Jesus. Okay, so that's a lot of yes. research about a single star. And yes. it basically proves that these criticisms that we, we brought up at the beginning of mm -hmm. common arguments against, you know, why Christmas is it. Yes. Yeah, they're trying to deconstruct Christmas, and they're trying to deconstruct and say, well, stars can't do that, so it didn't exist. And, and this is and basically that's just proof crazy. that these people weren't as ignorant as many modern people suggest they are exactly that's a, it, that's so true they were incredibly sophisticated people their technology wasn't as van, advanced as ours but the bottom line is they were very intelligent very sophisticated people and they were navigating the world by reading the stars and so the significance of the star is a big deal jupiter has always been considered the king star and another interesting fact about jupiter is this it is so big and its mass is so large it acts like a giant magnet drawing all kinds of asteroids careening through our solar system and comets as well it it acts like a giant magnet that pulls those things away from being able to hit the earth so it's almost like a protective shield it is a protective shield very much so it's a gravitational field of uh of gravitational magnetism and in a sense the jupiter the king star saves us from destruction it always has. And so what did Jesus come and do to save us 
from, from spiritual destruction. destruction. Yeah. Yes. And Jupiter, it, it, we track back through these star charts and stuff that that's what it was doing. We know exactly what it was doing in 2 BC and 3 BC. And this is why today scientists of really big things, you know, I, I call their scientists of big things and their scientists of really small things. And then there are scientists of all the stuff in the middle. And it's the scientists of really, really small things like quantum mechanics and stuff like that. And then really, really big things like planetary movements, gravitational fo- force, the creation of the universe, more and more of them are becoming theists. Mm. More and more of them are becoming theists because the mathematical probability of the existence of another earth are astounding because there are so many things that have to happen. Every earth to have life on it has to have a Jupiter right next to it. Because, you know, you look at the moon, you look at the, you look at Mars. What's the biggest thing that we see in Mars? Craters all the time. What happens when one little tiny rock the size of a basketball makes it through our atmosphere and hits the surface of the earth? It's massive destruction. Right. You know, it's massive. And yet almost none of that has happened for thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years. I mean, lots and lots of these scientists are becoming theists because the probability of this happening randomly is astronomical. And I use that pun intentionally. Pun intended. Well, I, I find this amazingly fascinating because having this kind of evidence and being able to use the technology Mm -hmm. these days to go back and be like, what was happening and what could these guys have seen that would possibly have caught, put them on this journey and being able to go, Oh, this is what they saw is <laughs> yeah. is pretty phenomenal. It gives you evidence. That's pretty hard to refute. Even if people are out there being mm-hmm. idiots and saying this is impossible. Well, or, just their, arg- it, their arguments are so unsophisticated, right? They think, Oh, because I feel this way and I I've got three facts, then I'm going to figure out, what highly intelligent people who've dedicated their lives to things over the last 2000 years, you know, t- building upon the, the knowledge that came before standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, all of this. And to discount all of that is such a solipsistic philosophy of life. It is so narcissistic. It is so self-centered. You know, you, you, you grow up in America, you know almost nothing, you've read almost nothing, you have no idea, and then to stand on your soapbox on TikTok and try to say that this is all fake is absolutely unbelievable to me. Absolutely. And it's especially when you think about everything that had to happen. God's major plan is just so remarkable where Joseph and Mary come to Bethlehem. They're visited by the Magi at the exact time that they need to be so that then the angel can send them off to Egypt and they have basically assets to be able to use to do that Mm -hmm. and live and survive. And then they eventually come back to Nazareth at the right time. It's just a, a really remarkable plan. It is a remarkable plan. And what's amazing about it is not just from a personal level, these stories of these people are so compelling and what mm. they're going through. They're making decisions. But then you start to see all of this environmental, all of this astronomical, the astronomy, the science, all of these things are occurring at the same time. The political machinations the of that Rome, that, <laughs> yeah, that the roses, ro- that roads existed and you could travel to different places and Rome had brought peace, but yet it was going through all this political turmoil. Because remember, Caesar Augustus was the first true emperor of Rome. Right. Right at that point, he was like a, an authoritarian ruler and all of this is going on and it's just the beginning of all these layers all these subtle layers of all these incredibly wonderful things happening that shows the great links god would go to in order to make it possible for you to come home and be with him one thing many college students um are given today as an argument against god when they show up as freshmen and sophomores at university is how can a loving god send people to hell why would he create a hell and then be so cruel to send people to it it just doesn't make any sense to them as a matter of fact i have a video of this young gal she says she's an atheist and she actually articulates this whole argument against god let's listen to it Okay, why do you worship a God who's so cruel that they would create people with brains and reasoning ability that, and also leave zero evidence or proof of his existence and then punish you forever for not having enough faith? Um, 
in what men say about him. Like, that's cruel as f***. And if you think that that would be cool, then you guys deserve each other. And I don't, I don't want anything to do with you. So you can see is that uh, I'd like to say a couple things. First of all, she's a very attractive young lady. And number two, she's articulate. She strings her ideas together well. But what she does is she creates a straw man. And a straw man in logic is a fallacy where you set up a uh, fake argument so that you can tear it down. And what's interesting about her argument is there's zero self-awareness. Um, you, you've been taught that you, she, this is her perspective in my opinion, is that she's been taught that she and what she feels is the most important thing in the universe. And then you end up with all this kind of weird straw man logic that makes absolutely no sense because first and foremost is the entire Bible communicates the exact opposite of what she said. So she's the, the so the fallacy is saying that, well, God, uh, creates you with thinking ability. Oh, well that is true. So then my question is, is why aren't you using yours? Yes. <laughs> okay. Then she says, and then he doesn't give any existence of, any proof of his existence, he has. The, the revelation records all kinds of proof of his existence, but there's also very strong philosophical and logical reasons for his existence. And some of the smartest people in the world are becoming theistic more and more often, like the scientists and so forth, because the logic of it is overwhelming right. of that there has to be a God for the universe to exist. There has to be an uncaused cause. There has to be, otherwise it doesn't make any sense sense. And so, and if it doesn't make sense, then we can't even trust our reasoning power today, but she doesn't like the proof. That's the issue. Mm. She doesn't like the proof. Now there's lots of proof. Now you can reject the proof, but that's an act of will. And that's a choice Yes, based on your faith. It has nothing to do with logic or science or anything else. And then the next thing she says is that, and then he punishes you for not having enough faith. Well, the Bible says the exact opposite of that. What the Bible teaches is that we human beings are the ones who brought evil into this world, not God. Okay. We did. So in a sense, we created evil and we created hell and every human being is going to hell because it is the consequence of what we created our own decisions. It's not that we don't have enough faith. That's not why we're going to hell. Everyone is already going to hell. We're already in the floodwaters and the waters are rising and we're going to drown. That is what it means to be born into this imperfect world. And then Jesus came to save us from this outcome. The destiny for every human being is death and it is to go to hell because of what we created, right? But therefore, well, I guess not a, but it's a, therefore, therefore, when Jesus showed up, it's not a question of enough faith. The question is, what am I placing my faith in? Am I going to place it in myself to swim out of these waters? Or am I going to place it in Jesus? Who is the only one who has the power to save me from it? That's what the Bible says. What she says, the Bible says, isn't what the Bible says. It says the exact opposite of what she says, and if you're going to disagree with it, I don't have a problem with that because then what you are is you're an intellectually honest person. You say, I've read it. I know exactly what it means. I don't believe it. Okay. But she didn't do that. Right. You see, she just said, this is what I think it is. And I don't want to believe that. And in my opinion, that just makes you stupid. Yeah. I think the ignorance of people, especially intelligent people is really astounding, astounding. <laughs> Because they have the ability to go through and do the work and see the logic and what exists and what is actually said, but they don't, they just make assumptions or they go based off of what they think it says. And they're not being honest. Like you said, they're, yeah. they're basically doing a shortcut and it's like, well, one of my friends said this, so he probably read it and came to this conclusion rather than mm -hmm. I'm going to read the book. I'm going to make a decision. And if you choose not to believe it, that's fine, but don't say that it says something that it doesn't say, say right? exactly you exactly just create these arguments because they're the easy ones to knock down and mm -hmm. it's just it's really 
a lot of people being very confused and not yeah. doing the work. It propagates confusion, I think, and that's a problem. And I mean, inherently, there's a lot of really smart people that, you know, our tendency is to be lazy. So it's like, yeah. well, uh, there's a guy that I, you know, I think he's pretty intelligent and he said this and he must have done the work and he was basing his research off of somebody who, or not research, yes. who also, it's like, there's a lot of that where it's like, this book is not that, in, like, it is so accessible that it's literally the exactly. best-selling book on the planet. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever. It's like, go and read it yourself. And if you yeah. have, you know, do the work. Or listen to the salty pastor and get the tools so you can do the work yourself. And make up your own mind, but at least make up your mind based on the actual facts. Well, and I think the other issue is some people will read it and not believe it, and that's fine. But it ultimately comes down to those people just don't want to come home. They, right. they don't want to believe that there mm -hmm. is something better they have some brokenness in them or some some hiccup in their in their Correct. thought process and so until they're willing to do that they're they're probably just going to be lost yeah and, frank and turek who travels around he wrote the book i don't have enough faith to be an atheist frank turek he goes around and speaks on college campuses and atheists come to his talks all the time and everything and he always asks him this question towards the end they'll ask question they'll answer question goes can i I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer honestly. If Christianity was proven to be 100% correct, would you become a Christian? And eight, nine times out of 10, they always say no. Mm. And that, that's just it. It's because people, it's pride. They don't want the, the idea that I'm accountable to something above me frightens people mm. to death. Absolutely. You know, I think this is the invitation of Christmas and it's why we celebrate Christmas. We're celebrating, uh, the real possibility of going home, the place where our souls truly belong. And if my pride gets in the way, then guess what? Pride is what keeps me from being home. Mm. And so you have to put aside your pride. Uh, you have to say, if it's proven to be true, I need to come home because this is where I belong. And that's what this is all about. It's about you finding that place where you belong, where you were meant to be. That's what Christmas is about. It's inviting you to come and be who you're meant to be, belong where you were meant to belong, to come home. Well, thank you, Pastor, for enlightening us on some of these arguments that are raised against Christmas and then the facts of the matter. Yes. So I think that's really great going into the season where you could potentially convince someone that they are not in as fully informed as they think they are. And I think that's, <laughs> that that's sometimes helpful and sometimes it's not, but you yes. are at least working out your faith and making those muscles grow so you can critically think and you know what you believe that's and right. why you believe it, which is ultimately our goal. I want to challenge you guys to make sure you invite someone to, uh, Christmas, Christmas Eve, Eve services, whether it's a friend or family member, whether it's online or on campus, maybe you're just watching it at your home with a friend or a family member, or you actually bring them to campus. Either way is a great way to get them in the spirit and understand why Christmas really exists and what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So make sure you do that. Thank you guys so much for joining us and make sure you tune around on Sunday to hear more from Pastor Doug as he preaches on these verses. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And we'll see you on Sunday. Merry Christmas.